Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Token Post interview. Today we have invited Mr. Zachary Fallon, the principal and founder of Quetzal Consulting and a former SEC senior counsel. Welcome. Thank you. Happy so, to be here. <laughs> so, Mr. Fallon, could you give a brief introduction about yourself and the overview of your career? Sure. Um, as you said, I'm a principal and founder of Quetzal Consulting. I also am a principal and founder of its affiliated law firm called Blakemore Fallon, mm -hmm. um, both of which aim to provide guidance to partic market participants in the cryptocurrency space, both in the form of strategic business and strategic legal advice um, in, in that area. Uh, prior to this, these current roles, I was, a, as you said, a, a formerly a senior counsel in the mm -hmm. U United States Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was there for nine years. And um, prior to that, I was uh, in private practice for three years, um, working in London and San Francisco in, in the capital markets. Uh, and did some other things before that, but. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have an extensive career based on finance of corporate laws, but what made you move to the cryptocurrency business? So uh, over the last, the last year of, of my time at the SEC, I began to, to research and to learn more about blockchain technology and mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies, primarily because of the ICO craze in 2017. Mm -hmm. It became much more of a pressing issue that there needed to be some uh, learning and understanding uh, as to the technology and to the digital assets being issued on top of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, in that process, I, uh, as many people, um, became fascinated with it and the, the potential for the technology to, to, uh, to affect any number of the walks of people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I became very interested in that. And uh, generally, I, um, you know, I wanted to leave the SEC because I felt there was a, a need for guidance in, from a regulatory standpoint, from a securities mm -hmm. law standpoint, that was lacking. And to the extent that I could come out into the private sector and help bridge a divide between the private sector and, and regulatory bodies, I wanted to f try to find a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I believe in the long-term prospects of the technology, um, and I think it's important for, uh, for regulators and the, and the private sector to connect and have uh, meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. So I hate to dig into your past, but uh, when you were in the SEC, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what were your primary roles in, as a senior counsel? Sure. Um, I, well, I started in the office of general counsel, which mm -hmm. was sort of like the, the SEC's <laughs> lawyer. So they have their, their own, like their in-house lawyer. Mm -hmm. I was there for three years, and then I transitioned to the, the division of corporation finance mm -hmm. and worked in the office of small business policy. So as its name suggests, it was all about the policies affecting smaller companies in the U.S. Um, and the ways in which they can raise capital. Also happening around that time was the, were the beginning of what is called crowdfunding or what people call crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And the, the, trends, uh, the trends in crowdfunding, and we had new legislation passed that affected crowdfunding uh, or required the SEC to adopt crowdfunding type rules. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough to be on, on some of those teams that helped draft or implement those regulations and functioned uh, in that space for a handful of years. Uh, wrote some of the regulations and some of the policy positions on the back of the regulations. Uh, I don't write them on my own. There's, there's others. There's others with me. But but for the you know it's a team effort. So um, and then I had the good fortune to work with our uh, division director directly as a his senior special counsel for for one mm -hmm. year. So as a person who's deeply re related with finance regulation, uh, as you might know, the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry regulation is a big concern. So how do you, as yourself, personally view or think the regulation should go? Um, my personal view is we have, we have sufficient regulation in the United States to mm -hmm. deal with the technology. Um, there may be some gray areas on the, on the fringe, but for the most part, the vast majority of companies functioning in the space, um, there, are, there is sufficient regulation. I think what more than anything, what needs to happen is to have a better understanding of the existing um, existing regulatory options for companies mm -hmm. and to, to help companies appreciate the purpose behind securities laws and how to, um, how to offer digital assets to the extent that they are securities, because not all of them are, but to the extent they are securities, that uh, how they can offer them in a compliant manner. So I think the, the regulatory environment is not new in the US. It's <laughs> been around for 80, 80 some odd years now and uh, it's also not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of guidance and lore. Um, there's a lot of, lot of learning that's already happened. 
uh, this technology, the digital assets that are being offered on the technology to the extent that their securities mm -hmm. um, fall within pretty, pretty clear guidelines from a regulatory standpoint as far as the, how to capture them. There are some certain facts and circumstances determinations in, with respect to what is a security, mm -hmm. and I think that can cause some confusion. But when you, when you actually, uh, when you really drill into those requirements, they're not so. There's not. They're not so gray. They're. Mm -hmm. They're pretty. They can be pretty clear. Um, that's not to say all gray is eliminated. It's just mm -hmm. that it's. I think there's a, a misconception that the, the regulatory framework in the U.S. is very uncertain, and I, I don't. I don't share that view. Um, but I do think uh, I do think there's there are ways in which you can you can navigate out of the system and but for the most part the vast majority of these uh, look like securities and they probably are securities. Uh, recently, the head counsel, uh, Mr. Uh, Jay Clayton, released on an interview that he will not be or the SEC will not be switching any infrastructure regulatory infrastructure framework in the positive aspect or they will not be switching their regulations according. To cryptocurrencies, do you share? Do you agree with that perspective, or do you believe there should be some modifications? No, I, I share that view. I, I think I think the definition of a security doesn't need to change mm -hmm. because of the existence of of blockchain technology or digital assets being offered on on top of, of blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. The as I said before, the definition itself is pretty flexible, principles based. So mm -hmm. there's flexibility within the definition itself, mm -hmm. but the general the general stat. Um, the general framework for what constitutes an investment contract, which is the analysis that most people use when they're thinking about whether this digital asset is a security, that analysis is a is a is that framework mm -hmm. that helps you determine if something is an investment contract mm -hmm. is is a position that has come out through common law or through the courts basically and the mm -hmm. Supreme Court uh, interpretations of what is an investment contract. And that what they've their their interpretation is a flexible standard. So, mm -hmm. I don't think that there's a need to change this. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question of I think as of advocacy on some level and of appreciation of the nuances and facts mm -hmm. to to figure out whether something is or isn't a security. I don't think the SEC needs to change mm -hmm. the definition of a security on the back of this. So today you're here to give a presentation on U.S. regulatory framework for uh, security offerings, uh, which deeply relates to ICOs, pre-sales, crowdfundings, and other matters. Could you explain a little bit about this topic? Sure. Um, we have a, a, a in the United States, if you're going to offer and sell a security, you need to either register that offering or conduct the offering pursuant to an exemption from registration. Mm -hmm. Regist uh, registering an offering is a is a lengthy. Uh, potentially lengthy, potentially costly process, um, on the back of which you have to have uh, provide ongoing reports to the SEC. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it requires a certain discipline that many startups don't have and shouldn't be expected to have either on some level. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than requiring those companies to register the offering with the, SEC, with the SEC, the SEC has a bunch of different types of exemptions from registration. Mm -hmm. And those exemptions from registration provide companies with flexibility uh, in, in various ways to raise capital from, from companies. And so you have, um, you have an option set mm -hmm. that depending on, uh, for instance, the type of investors you're trying to raise money from, are they sophisticated, are they wealthy, or are they retail investors? Mm -hmm. um, the manner in which you want to offer the securities, are you going to be reaching out to the, to the general public? Mm -hmm. Or do you know a certain set of people who you can offer this thing to privately? The amount of capital you're trying to raise? Are you just trying to raise uh, less than a million dollars, or maybe up to fifty million dollars, or potentially hundreds of millions of dollars? Your your options uh, from a regulatory standpoint vary based on these types of factors. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know whether you're going to pre-sell or or do an ICO, those types of things, and you're going to be offering a security. Mm -hmm. You you have you you would look to those options to say, in all likelihood, most startups would look to those options and say, okay, well, what how how can I raise this money? What's the ultimate business goal? Do I want this thing in, in a broad, um, this digital asset in a bunch of people's hands or just a few? And uh, you know, it's probably a bunch. So then that, that obviously drives some of the conversation. Uh, in a sense, uh, since uh, when a person is conducting a cryptocurrency crowdfund, uh, those receiving, those on the receiving end of the fund is qu quite difficult to locate because uh, locate who the investors are sure. because they don't. Pr uh, provide any uh, specific names. Uh, they just simply get a 
a wallet address. Right. So how would the regulatory framework be uh, shielded upon those who cannot be specifically uh, named? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's one of the challenges from a regulatory standpoint, mm -hmm. how, how to know who is behind the investment, mm -hmm. whether it's one wallet, but there's hundreds of investors mm -hmm. in that wallet, or whether it's um, five wallets all owned by the same person with different addresses, right? Mm -hmm. So I think um, from a regulatory standpoint, knowing who your investors is is an important, is an important part of being compliant. Mm -hmm. um, more so for the, the brokers and dealers in the space, mm -hmm. uh, but the, from the issuers too. And the reason is that as an issuer, you need to understand, uh, you need to be able to count your, invest, your investors. You need, because there's, there are certain tests which may require you to do things from a regulatory standpoint to the extent you have a certain number of investors. And how can you know if you have a certain number of investors when everyone is behind, um, when everyone's behind a, a wallet address, and you don't really, you can't look behind that mm -hmm. uh, from a, on a protocol level necessarily, maybe, um, to find out who actually owns these things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you can't locate who the investors are, um, and in that uh, environment, when a regulator regulations are imp impl implemented, uh, uh, it could, you know, hinder the process, the entire process of crowdfunding. It could uh, hinder some. Per se, if I am an investor who's willing to uh, look, uh, invest into a project and uh, you know seek further uh, profit, may be from that platform, uh, it might uh, frustrate those who are willing to small-time investors. Maybe uh, regulations might hinder their investments, and those who are seeking, those who are conducting uh, what you would call a ICO, they might uh, be affected negatively from the regulations. Uh, so how does the uh, government, U.S. government, or maybe governmental institutions view such uh, actions or results from regulations? I mean, I think on some level, it's the onus is on the company mm -hmm. to issue securities, if they are in fact securities, in a, in a manner that is compliant with the law. And if, if the technology as currently uh, as it currently works mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't allow you to c conduct the offering in a way that is compliant with the law that is knowing knowing your customers mm -hmm. or otherwise knowing who the holders are then that's that's really on the issue where it's the that's not really a solution that the regulators can um, can cure because it's right. happening on the te technological side on the on the um, on uh, the, in the private sector yes so yes. I think um, so I think you know, it's, the onus is on the issuers to, to offer in a compliant manner and to demand solutions for some of these uncertainties. Mm -hmm. So uh, although there have been constant concerns for regulations, some believe that regulation should come forward to establish a boundary to protect investors. And to that, the SEC recently appointed a new position they call Senior Advisor for Digital Assets and Innovation to manage blockchain and cryptocurrency sector. Will it move the regulatory framework, like you mentioned, a little bit faster to be implemented? Um, I think what it'll do is is centralize a bit um, more formally in, in any way um, the the knowledge, the most knowledgeable persons mm -hmm. in the space that are within the commission. Um, Valerie Sesapanic, who is the person you're mm -hmm. mentioning, is an expert in this, and she's been uh, working in the space from the beginning at the SEC, so she's very knowledgeable and, and is a good person to have, um, to the extent that questions come in, mm -hmm. to have the person who can who can help drive the conversation or at least manage that process internally. In many ways, in, in some ways likely that she was already doing in some of the prior roles, but to formalize that is, I think is a good step, mm -hmm. in the right is a step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, remains to be seen what, you know, if it, if it moves things along, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it'll, I don't, going back to what you said, with <laughs> Chairman Clayton said before, mm -hmm. um, what it means to move things along in this space, I think is, is not so much driving regulatory change, mm -hmm. but more of, of making sure that there is learning in the private sector as to what is actually mm -hmm. currently already required. And, uh, and, and so I think that, that, is a, 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 that would be helpful. So rather than changing, it's simply combining or adopting the two separate systems so that they remain in a regulatory uh, framework. For, are you talking from the personnel standpoint? Um, it's it's about you know focusing resources mm -hmm. and and expertise mm -hmm. in uh, in a more focused way um, in a central location rather than perhaps dis uh, disparate uh, across mm -hmm. the commission. Although I suspect that'll still happen. Mm -hmm. 
So moving on to the next part, uh, price manipulation is another concern for crypto investors. With the market not being big enough, it is indeed possible for uh, whale investors to man manipulate price and kind of tweak the system. Yep. How should such problem be solved? Well, the, the, you need discipline in the aftermarket, uh, the aftermarket trading. You need, you need um, which is why you see, I think, Statements coming from the SEC, as an example, as to uh, highlighting the fact that if you are if you are uh, intermediating securities transactions, mm -hmm. whether you can call them digital assets or cryptos, uh, if you're intermediating those in some fashion, then in all likelihood you may have to register as, as a broker dealer. Mm -hmm. And if it, if you're talking about at the exchange, at a platform level, then that broker dealer would need to um, be regulated, and either need to be registered as a as a uh, national Securities Exchange or offer, operate as pursuant to an exemption, uh, for instance, Regulation ATS. And when, you know, part and parcel of becoming regulated in that fashion is is to adopt policies and procedures that prevent against the type of manipulation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's uh, the absence of an appreciation for what people are actually, the, 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 uh, eco an absence of the appreciation of the regulatory framework in which people are operating mm -hmm. is causing the problem. Um, but that's not from the regulatory standpoint, that's just an, an ignorance on the part of the market. Mm -hmm. So that you have these, you have a lot of players in uh, functioning on unregulated exchanges that because they're unregulated, there's, they can do whatever they want in many ways. And so they, of course they're subject to manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kat, uh, Mr. Fallon, you are currently the pres uh, principal of Quetzal Consulting. You right. moved out of the SAC. So, what is your future plans for Quetzal, and how do you plan to pursue that goal? Well, I mean, I think our, our hope is to be able to provide strategic, strategic business advice from the consulting firm, strategic legal advice from the law firm mm -hmm. um, for market participants in this space. I think there is a need for greater learning, mm -hmm. uh, greater appreciation of the regulatory framework as it currently exists, mm -hmm. a greater appreciation um, for, for the concerns of regulators, mm -hmm. And so to the extent that we can help bridge that divide between regulators and the private sector uh, and, and increase the learning and the conversations between the two so that both can appreciate the other, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, I think that's, that's our ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So you plan to get deeper into the crypto space? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe ICOs, upcoming ICOs from Quetzal? Oh, a Quetzal a <laughs> coin? Uh, no, not on the menu at the moment. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. That is all the question we have today. I mean, hope to see you your firm get bigger and bigger. I hope to see your, meet your firm within the crypto space a little bit more. Do you have any last comments for our audience? No, uh, no, thank you. Uh, thanks for the time uh, for, for, and for, the, uh, for your sentiments. Um, it's been a great conference here and I've, I've really enjoyed myself in Seoul. <laughs> thank you for your time once again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. Zachary Fallon, the principal of, well, currently the principal of Quetzal Consulting.